Good yes, good afternoon everyone. Um, before you begin, um, Dr. Charles, I am Sue Ann Barrett, I'm a member of the faculty here at IGDS and always a pleasure to share space and time with you at lunchtime uh, to talk about some of the current research being done in relation to or intersecting with gender. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Kenneth Charles, who is a senior lecturer and consultant hematologist at the UE. He's a medical graduate of the UE and obtained postgraduate training in medicine and hematology in the United Kingdom. Of course, you know he's presenting on women and blood donation. So we're really excited to hear about your take on this. And I'm sure you have some in-depth knowledge that we would learn from. So get your questions ready, right? Hard questions. You all may sit at the table too. Please join in. Hard questions for Dr. Dr. Charles. Um, Dr. Charles was first exposed to the concept of voluntary non-remunerated blood donation while studying at, in the United Kingdom, and he's very much an advocate for this. His research interest is the dichotomy between blood transfusion services in England and her former colonies, and he has published several manuscripts on the subject, so you could follow it up on your own. He's convinced that replacement blood donation places a financial, social, and ethical burden on developing countries. Interesting. And is a fervent advocate, as I said, of exclusive, voluntary, non-renumerated blood donation. So really excited to hear about your perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yes. So we're going to speak about women and blood donation and these two women here, the woman on the your far left, is a voluntary non-remunerated mm. blood donor and a medical student uh, from the University of the West Indies Blood Donor Foundation. The young lady in the middle is a patient who has beta thalassemia major, which is a form of bone marrow failure that necessitates receiving a blood transfusion monthly. The young man to the far right is her brother, who was conceived in the hope that he would be a compatible donor for her, for a bone marrow transplant. But he turned out to have beta thalassemia major himself. So now they both require blood transfusions on a monthly basis. And I now um, delve into the what that entails. These are the Pan American Health Organization definitions of types of blood donor. So, our talk will take this format. We'll talk about the different types of blood donation, what the recommendations from health authorities are, give the history and background to how the previously described dichotomy arose, speak about blood donation among women globally, then specifically in Trinidad and Tobago, relate the experience of the University of the West Indies Blood Donor Foundation, of which I'm immensely proud and uh, highlight some implications of what they've done for the future. Blood donors are defined in three ways. The most desirable blood donor is a voluntary, non-remunerated blood donor who just donates blood and walks away feeling happy that he or she has saved one life or three and gets nothing in return for it except the joy and good feeling of doing that. A family replacement donor is a person who is recruited by a patient or the patient's family or the health system to donate blood as a trade-off for the patient receiving a medical service. It's a very rigorous approach and causes tremendous problems which I'll describe as we go along. And remunerated Blood donors receive payment in one kind or the other. This is the world distribution of uh, blood donors, the blood supply. The areas in green represent the areas where blood is uh, adequate, the supplies are bountiful. And the areas in red, yellow, brown represent the areas where there's chronic blood shortage. As can be seen, the green areas represent the, uh, the countries of uh, the North Atlantic and what used to be called the uh, 
settler colonies. Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Of course, all the countries in Europe practice it, and as much they, as such, they have a hefty blood supply. The countries in red, brown, and yellow are all the previous uh, extraction colonies, where the people existed for the good of the, uh, the mother country. And the blood transfusion systems have developed along those lines. So in all the previous countries, there's 100% voluntary, non-remunerated blood donation. And generally, in the brown, beige, and yellow countries, there's nothing but family replacement donation. As a result, most of the maternal deaths every year occur in those countries with the family replacement blood donation systems. And most of those deaths are because of hemorrhage. They bleed to death because of inadequacy of the blood supply. Please keep that in mind, and that is one of the, the bigger disadvantages to family replacement donation systems. In the Caribbean and Latin America, a direct link has been demonstrated between the adequacy of the blood supply and maternal mortality, paving the way for voluntary non-remunerated blood donation, or justifying it. This is what happens in a family replacement blood donation system. Children of mothers get HIV. Mothers or potential mothers bleed to death during delivery. And it happens again and again and again. And we attribute it variably to botched surgery or slip ligature. The common reason is that whatever, there's no time for recovery from botched surgery because there's no available blood supply. And because everybody has surgical complications. And it should not be that if somebody has a surgical complication, somebody bleeds to death. We now talk about the history of blood transfusion. I'll go through it reasonably quickly just to highlight some points. As you can see, human to human blood transfusion was first done in England at a time when Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean were colonies. So blood transfusion happened first there. Keep in mind we are colonies at this time, and we'll go through. As things went on, Earlier developments or more of the early developments occurred in America or Canada, which are by then settler colonies. And as would happen in the settler colonies, they tried to outdo the, the mother country. So they took the blood transfusion uh, uh, practice further ahead. So much so that by the outbreak of World War I in 1914, or shortly after, in 1915, there was a Canadian called Lawrence Robertson who had picked up his uh, blood transfusion knowledge in the United States. He's a Canadian, and he went to work on the Western Front. And he introduced there, for the first time, transfusion from one person to the other. It was called indirect transfusion. In 1917, when the Americans joined the war, another Roberts, no relation, he introduced uh, blood depot for the first time, and the blood was stored in glucose and citrate. It was kept on the battlefield, and uh, people could donate. It lasted for 26 days. So they saved a lot of lives this, this way. Now, mind you, all this technology was happening on the battlefield. What is um, largely unknown is that while all this technology was being exchanged, there were soldiers from Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean on the battlefield. Yes? But I do believe they had access to the technology. There would have been anxieties in those times, can you imagine? About receiving the, the, the blood of, of somebody who who looked different. And it was very direct in those days, with the blood donor and the recipient very, very close. So suffice it to say there was no transfer of the information or the technology then. 
And as you can see, it was not only Trinidad and Tobago, but there was a whole British West Indies regiment that went to the First World War. But none returned with, with the technology. In between the, the two world wars, there was transfer of blood transfusion technology from the soldiers back to their communities. And this uh, British Red Cross worker called Percy Lane Oliver established a voluntary blood donor panel in the United Kingdom that became the first voluntary blood donor panel in the world. The first municipal voluntary blood transfusion service was set up in London and then voluntary blood donor panels were set up around the world, America, Canada and everywhere. So this single Liberian started it, and there was a woman who was the first blood donor, and it was Sister Linster. Yeah, so Sister Linster was the first voluntary blood donor. In between the First and Second World Wars came the Spanish Civil War, when two Spaniards, Horda and uh, no, Hume was a Canadian, but they established uh, blood transfusion services in Madrid and Barcelona, and they collected blood from the community to supply the armies, because it was a civil war. I think it was the Republicans against the, the Royalists. Well, there were two groups that were fighting. There were about 500,000 deaths or something. So it was heavy blood loss. So they needed blood from the community to supply the soldiers and civilians. So when World War II was looming, another woman, Janet Vaughan, who was a pathologist, she recruited Horder and Hume from the Spanish Civil War and adopted the technique of storing blood in London in preparation for German air raids. So women have played a big role in this throughout. Yes, young man? Oh, for civilians in this instance. So, yeah, so yeah. they graduated from providing it on the battlefield, now yes. it's to civilians. Yes, they transferred the technology to was battlefield, civilians. Right. Yes? But then, as you'll see here, there was a second uh, blood depot, a military one, a British uh, blood transfusion service. And they also collected blood from the community to ship to the Allies, Britain and Allies. You all following me so far? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Meanwhile, America and Canada also participated in supplying blood for the British. What is it? So there were blood for Britain campaigns in the United States of America and in Canada. They collected blood from their community, separated the plasma, and flew or shipped it for British soldiers. So you can see how many millions and millions of units were collected. Now while all this is going on, all this uh, technology and transfer is going on, one might wonder what was happening in the colonies. In Trinidad and Tobago, I was just saying to Janet, there was a veritable American occupation because under a land lease agreement to secure the southern entry ports to the United States, the British leased military bases to the Americans in exchange for 50 warships. So much so that by the, by the end of the deal, there were 223 American military bases on the island. Now we hear about two. I didn't know there were so many. <laughs> Where did they fit? <laughs> I'll show. Oh, I don't have the map here. It was up and down the country, young man. Up and down, 223. So there were 100,000 American soldiers, American, British, or Canadian soldiers on the land when the native population was 300,000. There were three military base hospitals. Now, my research tells me that at these military base hospitals, blood transfusion was performed. Yes? And there, were, there was all the, uh, the equipment and the, the mechanism for transfusing blood in those base hospitals. 
we had the largest natural harbor in the world in the Gulf of Paria. So that's where the convoys assembled to take raw material to the North Atlantic. We had the busiest airstrip in the world at Wallerfield, where planes landed for fueling and they flew from east to west and north to south. The island was ideal for jungle warfare training. It served as an excellent spying location for South America, where there were a lot of Germans posted. And we had the largest oil refinery in the world, in Point of Air, which supplied the bulk of energy for the American and British planes and ships. Now, if I were um, Hitler, I'd be interested in bombing that little island as well. Yes? Okay, okay, close. Yeah, so we were at threat. And because sometime during the Second World War, when, the, when, the, when uh, France fell to the Germans, the German colonies in the West Indies, that was Martinique and Guadeloupe and so on, the French colonies became German. The, the Vichy French was a French puppet government of the Germans, so they did the Germans' bidding. And my um, research tells me there was a French warship that was uh, with planes on board that was nested in Guadeloupe at the time of, of the turnover. So although the Germans had no warships of their own, it could easily be used to do an air raid on Trinidad and Tobago. It was Trinidad only then. And people practice air drills here. Those of you relatives who are old enough could tell you what the air, air drills. When you hear the siren, what do you do? So there was preparation for air drills. The U-boat war was very savage. More than 200 vessels were sunk outside of Trinidad and Tobago. And more than 7,000 men killed. 7,000 escaped injured and were taken to Trinidad for treatment. What treatment, young man, does a, a bummed man require? A bummed man require? Wow. Well, besides. <laughs> Bloody no, not bizarre. Okay. Only that. You want to think. Yeah. Fusion treatment. Yes. For sure. Yes. So there were all these people washing ashore. But there was no local blood supply. And I found this stamp on the internet that shows that blood from the British Army collection center was flown to the West Indies. So one is to assume that with the military base hospitals and all these casualties that possibly transfusion occurred there. But was that the case? Beg your pardon? Was that the case? Actually, I don't know. Something had to be the case because it was either that or leave the soldiers to die. Mm. Yes, because there was no local blood collection. Yes, Janet? Was this a, um, like a, a poster that was to encourage people to get blood? Is this where your blood goes? Oh, it was a stamp. A stamp. Oh. It was during the World War. It was put out to show the uh, blood donors there. Oh yes, you're quite right. So sort of um, yes, encourage them as well. To yes, the yes. So this is where what happens to your blood. Yes, because I was banging my head over what, where could this blood have come from, and I stumbled upon this on the internet. It's a stamp from 1942, I believe. Now, the Americans were also able to, to fly blood as far away as Japan. So one would think um, to Trinidad and Tobago was a, a skip in the park.
So this was the state of the blood transfusion system in Trinidad at the time of World War II. There was no blood bank, no storage facility, there was no community donor pool. There was one colonial hospital that did blood transfusions every now and then. And the local Red Cross, which was a branch of the British Red Cross at the time, had a grand total of 40 volunteers on standby should blood be required. Population was 300,000. After that, blood transfusion developed slowly and in a segmented and ad hoc fashion. <coughs> Just after the war in 1951, 55 units were collected in a whole year on the island, which suggests no transfusion systems were left after the war. So things developed on a hospital-based system where people would donate blood for their relatives and nothing else. In 1986, a National Blood Transfusion Service was formed and things eventually evolved into these two patterns of blood donation. In one of them, the family replacement blood donation, one donates blood at the behest of the health system. The doctors or the ward or the nurse or the hospital tells you, you need surgery, find two blood donors to secure surgery. And that has become the norm. A fashionable alternative has become what I call the, it is called voluntary blood donation here, but it's a form of blood investment. This lady is laughing guiltily. She probably has one of these pink cards in her back. Huh? You know, <laughs> proud of you. So one is able to donate, well, invest blood, and be assured that one gets a credit for, for doing so, and one could maintain a balance and withdraw it at any time, be it five years from now, ten years from now. One could withdraw it. Like a bank account? Yes. It's called an account. <laughs> yes? And these two methods of blood donation have gone on for about 50 or 60 years. This Englishman wrote about it, surprised at that he did, explain how the system works. Where he's a cardiac surgeon and the patients had to find two blood donors and get well, four blood donors and obtain four chits as proof of donation before the surgery was booked. And as he was aware, there was a potential for selling the chits and blood in exchange for medical services. A black market? A red market. <laughs> yes. It's quite a trade. As a result of these two systems, collect a lot less blood than we need to in the country. And because of the arrangements, the blood collected is not necessarily the blood available. Because remember, it is sequestered for specific people. So it may be there physically, but not available. <coughs> As is demonstrated here, Curacao was a previous Dutch colony, and they practiced 100% voluntary, non remunerated blood donation from the time of the Second World War, and have continued to do so. These statistics show, one, the amount of blood that is collected is 366 per 10,000 in Curacao per year, compared to 171 per 10,000 in Trinidad and Tobago. And that's because Curacao has a totally voluntary, non remunerated blood donation system, where people come in regularly and just donate. They don't wait to be called or to be threatened. The statistics here show the prevalence of infections 
HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, syphilis, human T lymphotrophic virus in the blood donors. And one can see the difference in the percentages. But now how would those differences be explained? Ah, young man. Because one group is doing it freely and has no reason to lie, or plunder, or plot, or deceive. And the other is doing it by the scruff of his neck. Is doing it or else. You with me? Yeah. And then of course there's a high um well I'm not no percentage of people who are selling the, the favor. Right. Uh, in, in terms of selling the chicks and what not the Yeah, so therefore people like this, usually the blood donor interview, if answered uh, honestly, it excludes people who are at risk of being infected. Right. Yes? Mm. Because somebody who's at risk would declare it and not donate. But if somebody is being um, rewarded in some physical way for donation, they don't necessarily um, reveal it. So all of this, yes ma'am? This is why the form, because yes. I'm not voluntary blood donor, ah. I'm San Fernando General. Yes. The form is so extensive, they delve into sexual history, yes. medication, tattoos and so mm -hmm. on. And well, as I was thinking, people actually do things like that. Now it makes sense because they would sell the chit. So you come and you lie and you donate and then you go and you sell the chit and you get the monetary reward. Mm -hmm. So now the form actually makes sense. Yeah, the form makes sense because it's what is the recommended questions. But it's of no value if one is collecting blood by that way because people will all not tell the truth anyway. So you think that's the primary mechanism by which these diseases would make their way in? Or yes, it is, it is, and it's proven everywhere. Uh -huh. It's proven everywhere. Where there's replacement donation, there's this. It's proven, and which is why the international organizations advocate against replacement blood donation, because it's not safe. What did you say was the percentage of voluntary to replacement? We're here. Mm -hmm. In Germany. Where? Really, we have no voluntary donation here. We don't? No. It's so when you go to take donate blood, that's not voluntary? No, no, no. It's, it's um, once you, you receive, well, we have voluntary donation now, a small segment which I'm here to boast about. <laughs> um, it's so small. But, but generally, generally the, the donations have been either to secure a medical service for a relative, so it's replacement, or with the option to reclaim one's donation at a later time, which is considered remunerated. It's payment. Yes? Because it could be converted to cash. Yes? Because you could sell the, uh, the right. You never ask that they are like holding yes. gold. Yeah. So both of those uh, methods of blood donation have been discouraged by the Pan American Health Organization for quite a while. So numerous blood safety resolutions dating back to 1975, all of which advocate voluntary and non-remunerated blood donation and termination of both replacement and paid donation for the safety of the population and the donors as well, many of them. We don't know when we'll need blood. This young lady has a bone marrow failure. This young lady, this lady was walking down Frederick Street, had her leg blown off, because there was a, a, a bomb in, in a, a bin. Oh. This pregnant lady, I met at the National Blood Transfusion Service when I was its director, and I asked her what was she doing there in her pregnant state. And she said to me she brought her husband to donate. Because pregnant women are expected to find blood donors in case anything happens at delivery. Standard procedure. Yes. This lady is a, it's a lady from Grenada. She was visiting and I think she came across with an infection that caused widespread clotting and bleeding. She developed 
what is called disseminated intravascular coagulation and needed a lot of blood components. Of course, she couldn't find replacement donors. She's not from here. She's visiting. Yes? So the arrangement makes no sense. Of course, we know of the road traffic accidents that happen every now and then. We researched the attitudes of blood donation in Trinidad and Tobago. We found that um, blood donation is low in all demographic groups. And the general reason for it was lack of information and uh, the inconvenience of donation. Access was poor to centers. That's what the donation in the demographic groups look like. There was no significant difference between men and women in this uh, survey. But the reasons for not donating differed. Most women had a fear of acquiring disease from blood donation. And of course, what would encourage them to become donors? They still hang on to that. Replacement for a family or friend, because that's all we've ever known. Mm -hmm. Isn't it, man? It's all we've ever known. You give for her, or you give for him. The power of language. Yeah. Yes. I think uh, yeah. I'm surprised that on that reason for not giving is health, which is that a lot of women have low um, HB or anemic mm. or whatever, yeah. and you're excluded because mm. of that. So no, you no this, was, this was their reason for not giving. Oh, this is the health. people who had yeah. never given. Because I'm just saying, yeah. I know I always hear that yeah. people who Yes, they go to the replacement yeah. or invest, but they're like, so sorry, you can't mm -hmm. because you're, you have yeah. problems with your, mm -hmm. with your blood. Yeah. So I just wondered, you know, how do we then attend to that, even when somebody's trying to volunteer, but they're yeah. not, you know, they can't help it. I mean, you can eat, but whatever. Yeah. How which, do we address that problem in terms of women yeah. and giving blood? Okay. Which, which, sure. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very good um, question. Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll address. I'm glad you asked it. So you looked at blood donor deferral causes in Trinidad and Tobago. This is in 2010, and you're, you're quite right that um, anemia was a big cause. Yes, and uh, it was the most common reason for deferral in women. Nearly half of the, the uh, deferrals in women were because of anemia. And probably because of the reason you described. Yes. yes? But I'm saying if you know you are a regular and voluntary blood donor, you will make sure you keep your blood up. That's all? Mm -hmm. yes, yes. And take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Do you know what percentage of people might be rejected because of things like? For example, I, I know that when I had dengue fever, I wasn't allowed to donate for a certain period of time. Yes, and there yes. are certain, you know, malaria and other things. Yes. I'm not quite sure how long they prevent you from giving blood, but is that a factor in Trinidad? It is, because um, many of the, from this same study, if I show you, the other, a lot of it were uh, things like that. Maybe people had a viral infection within the last two weeks or they traveled to uh, Latin, uh, South or Latin America where the um, Chagas disease is prevalent and blood donors are excluded for six months after returning from there. So a lot of it was for reasons that could have been prevented if people were given the information beforehand. So they came there to find out. So what limits women's blood donations globally? There you go, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, their weight, oftentimes, they are allowed to donate less frequently than men are. The typical uh, permission for women is twice per year, as opposed to three times a year for men. They often become anemic because of menstrual periods. Pregnancies could interrupt the donation pattern. They are more prone to adverse events like fainting and so and they're more likely to um, sever ties after one episode.
Globally, in the developed countries, women constitute about 40 to 55 percent of blood donors, notwithstanding the preceding. 40 to 50 percent. Because they are considered the caring and nurturing type, which I know they are. As a matter of fact, in 1982 in, in Canada, when there were two types of, of blood donation present, one of them was voluntary donation, and the other is commercial blood donation, which is still allowed, but it's not blood for transfusion. It is blood that is taken and processed and fractionated, so the same rigidity does not apply. But if blood is for transfusion, it could only be collected from voluntary, non remunerated blood, blood donors. So they looked, yes, young man? All right. They looked at the proportions of men and women in both groups and found that the women, the voluntary group, far um, exceeded the men as opposed to the commercial group where the men predominated. Because men do it as a transaction. Yes? You give it, you get the job done. Give it, somebody needs it, you give it. A woman is compassion and altruism. It's two different types of blood donation. And Dr. Charles. Yes? So what is the difference now? You mentioned um, with respect to voluntary, non immunerative donation, with respect to blood transfusions, which would be whole blood, um, mostly, right? Whole no, blood. No, no transfuse whole blood. Well, the, the, yeah. well, basically the larger components. Yeah, but yeah. When you need to get specific components of blood, very specific components of yeah. blood, and separate it, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, the, that process would no longer be different. You said com the commercial system would more apply to that type of... Yes. No, that with, I think the commercial system mostly takes the plasma and fractionates it, right. and makes powder for bits of it, like factor eight and factor nine and albumin and that. Mm -hmm. So that's a commercial extraction. But then that is put through about 10 to 15 purification steps. Right. Okay. Yes? So it involve more of the, yeah. uh, how to put it, the um, commercial sector getting involved in yes. performing yes. these modifications. So therefore, that sector could accept um, paid blood donors, which is why it's another myth that comes back here. Where people go to the um, United States and see blood being collected in that way, and it's true that people pay for blood for transfusion in America. It is different. Again, it's language again. It's language. And that, uh, I think that affects our uh, behavior here as well. But in developing countries, the donation rates by women are a lot lower, and that impacts the supply, which is already low. It's like 6% in India. So in Trinidad and Tobago, as we said, women need to, to donate blood in pregnancy. It's a precondition. It also happens in Jamaica, I was horrified to know. And uh, happens in Nigeria. I don't think that much is said about it or written. But in Nigeria, they did. I saw a paper on the uh, the perspective, the perspective of fathers who are asked to donate blood for their wives, and they give an account of it. This has been written about it, but we know that a lot of blood that is collected in this way is never needed by the by the woman in question. And we've done a study here to show that, and it's been shown elsewhere as well. So when in uh, 2010, an attempt was made to discontinue the replacement and paid blood donation, there was a sudden and dramatic fall in blood donations in January 2011 compared to January 2010. Which, to me, su suggests if people were donating all along and receiving either the chit or the, the credit, mm -hmm. yes? Mm -hmm. And you stop them. Mm -hmm. And blood donations fell by 
this is you're talking about people you want people to volunteer now and yeah stuff. yes um like people yeah. when you're willing to do it they will get in something for it yeah and they thought it was really yeah. for somebody that they need yeah yeah so you could do it to get something else i have a question though what happens to the blood um <coughs> that was supposed to be used for the pregnant woman and it get well it varies it's a good question if it is um if it is uh if it gets back provided it's not taken away from the proper storage and kept on the ward for an an, an improper time which often happens yes why it could That's be terrible. yeah well, they do it for, for no, these are the things that happen man and it's done because of blood shortage so people want to be aware that if anything happens you have this blood here and a lot is returned, expired, and unusable because once blood remains outside of the proper conditions for more than 15 minutes, it's unsafe to use. So it's quite costly, apart from which when it is being um, kept for this person who never needs it, it's not available to anybody else anyway. Are there yeah. adequate storage facilities at yes. hospitals? Yes. So actually... Yes. They are, but the, 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 the whole thing about owning, remember these people have gone and. Yeah. Huh? So it's easier to pretend like yeah. this is a VIP, it's not for you. So yeah. We have the storage space, we have the blood there, but. Mm -hmm. So it's about owned so blood rather than available blood? Yes. Yes. What? Yes, because if you, find, if you go and find uh, your blood donors by whatever means necessary, and they make a donation. You have a, a check that's saying that you are entitled to this. Yes? Mm. This but it's shocking. You. I mean, basically, to me, it's unethical because... It is. Why would I want to ask people to donate blood if I know inevitably the blood is going to be thrown away? It's ridiculous. Unless you donate used. blood as a yeah. general sort of like philosophy that you are doing good. I know, I think that is what is played upon. It's sad. But I, I just wanted, to, I had a I, I know you're not finished your presentation and you have about 10 more minutes in terms of before Q&A, but I'm just curious as we at this point. Um, I, I suspect that for people to volunteer, they would have to have that particular philosophy or they would have to be encouraged either through some sort of attitude change campaign, etc. to actually go and volunteer. And, but the other part is for people who just do the replacement or the investment or the system that has been around for a long time, is there then an, a way to address how the blood is used in, in that there are protocols? So even if, so if I come in and I'm pregnant and I have my baby and fine and I don't need this blood, that there are these protocols that says, okay, blood is taken out at certain times, blood will be stored, uh, blood will be returned so that you maintain that viability so that the blood does not just go to waste. In essence, can there be protocols to stop that type of, well, it's my blood, so I don't want it, throw it in the garbage, kind of thing? There are, and there are in the uh, countries that are able to manage the systems in a proper and orderly way, mm -hmm. where there's no ownership of the blood, and it's there, the, the, there's not wastage, so that resources can be spent to refine the service, mm -hmm. and people could understand. Now, I think what happened in the developing countries is that um, this just arose as um, a way of doing things in a slapdash manner. And not much effort has gone into organizing the system. Yes? So, therefore, there's a lot of wastage, and all the replacement blood donation systems suffer it. Object research is impossible to manage a service if it's not properly organized and structured. You can't uh, control the rate of donation if 500 people converging on the service at the first time because 500 doctors told them you have to donate for your mother's surgery tomorrow. It's impossible. And that generates into to, uh, angry exchanges, frustration, it gives the, the whole service a bad name, 
and it's a vicious cycle because the service needs to be separated and treated like a baby because it's this the center the centerpiece of all health services and social development as I'll show you as well so the chips and uh, things were brought back and within four months just back to the same disorganization shortages and disorganization so then we did some research and I'll show you how we reassess the attitudes of our uh, people's uh, to blood donation it had not changed a jot So the future, like you say, is to spread this model around and increase women's advocacy for voluntary non regenerative blood donations. Nobody raises it. I mean, just accept that we have this, what I call this, uh, I can use the term here. And extend this model to the communities, we quite correct, and transition to a total voluntary non regenerative blood donation without a form. The numbers are doing three to four years. And this is what we did, just like we promised. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ch interesting, surprising, shocking, not so surprising at the same time. But I mean, we had conversation while we were talking, so we just want to continue the conversation for about 15 to 20 minutes and encourage you to ask your questions, make your comments. I mean, I think what is, what is significant is the charge to all of us, whether we are women or otherwise, to encourage those who are already giving blood to continue, and to, and which would be the women. And we, of course, will advocate at IGDS that we expand our campaign so that we but please make sure it is done in the proper way. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. You see, you see it the, if people run away with the idea that uh, you donate for the right to reclaim it, it oh, makes no, 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 voluntary. So, yeah, so but you might be have to define voluntary. Voluntary, very clearly. So because I just there's a there's a misconception that voluntary is an that, Yes. No, no, no. That's 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 a, a truism. Uh, that for here. But voluntary non remunerated is different from voluntary as defined here. I get you. Language. Huh? Language is key. Yes. So on that note, the floor is open. And I, have a, I have a, Dr. Charles, enlightening, I must say. Um, I have a question and a comment. You know, the generation now, and I exclude myself from the generation now, deliberately. There is a fascination with ink. And is it true, um, all these lovely people are inking all these things on their bodies, does that uh, exclude them from, from donating blood? No. Because I've, I've heard some controversy yeah. around that. Is yeah. that true or not? It's not true. If somebody has a tattoo, they can't donate for a year. Oh, just for a year? Just for a year. But it's a big misconception. There are many misconceptions yeah. around. Like you can't do it if you have hypertension or diabetes, those things are not true. Okay. There are very, very few reasons for exclusion from blood donation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, my comment is, I remember when the National Blood Service came into being in 1986, there was a lot of pomp and fanfare, there was a lot of information and education, you know, there was a the Blood Bank Carnival Fed, which was highly subscribed. But all of this has fallen away. And and we've gone into the malaise of the entire society, the wider society of, of, as you said in your words, slapdash. So what do we need to engage people again on the value, on, on the, 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 the essence, on the spirit of volunteerism when it comes to donating blood? And I, I say this against the fact that they are so, and I'm only, only going to use one of your slides, road accidents. I mean, there are so many accidents, almost weekly, almost daily. How do we, what, who, 
whose responsibility? Is it all of us? Is it some institution, agency? Note, I'm not saying the government. I'm tired of hearing that rhetoric. But who is it? How could we advocate that we re-engage the wider society on the value, virtue, the, the necessity of donating blood? Your comments, please. Yes, I believe in um, yes, I a scientific question. Doing things surreptitiously. Just do it. Just go on there, get the information as you do it. The assemble, the language changes. Yes? And I, I have had the experience of um, well, participating in this, uh, this sort of mass education ads and so on, and it totally it's going to be pretty ineffective mm. and the most um, potent way by talking to people and changing their language. One on one. But they, they honestly believe that this is all. Well, and they don't understand the implications. I'm sure a lot of what I showed you there is not generally known. Mm. The, uh, the risks that go with this, this manner of, of our blood donation and it's a risk that is not for, it's for everybody. Because any of us could end up being in a road traffic accident. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I was. I would like to make a suggestion yeah. for you. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, that, you said that, that things like advertising and whatnot, you don't find them particularly effective. But um, I think with respect to social media now, yeah. and this age group, this generation, yeah. um, they, are more, they are more emotionally sweet. Right. Yeah, and that's one aspect that it can use. So, and then they also on the phones constantly. Yeah. Um, always through the yeah. resource in their mind. Yes. But we, we, we don't do it as an ad, you know, just in a form. Yes? Mm -hmm. so it's happening and join it. So we don't go out and say, uh, so many thousand times need to so and so and so many dying or so. Mm -hmm. But that, that kind of messaging doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. have fruit. But get involved as a positive thing and contribute to the Small country that has this messy system, using means other than mass communication, and if yes, what did they do? Oh, very good question. It's, it's not as Nicaragua. Okay. It's not a very small country, but it's the poorest country in Latin America. Okay. And they managed to get rid of their equivalent of the check system in two or three years by generally changing how things are done. There was legislation to support it. And going out and forming the people. And <coughs> There's nothing more important than just go out and start with it. And people pick up. People pick up yes, question. Huh? So before we came on donor, I was told that I have chronic hypotension. I mean, my blood pressure is always low. When I was pregnant, it was rampant, so that they monitored it for the nine months, mm -hmm. and they realized that this is just. It's always under 120 over 80. But I'm not sick, I'm not ill, I'm not anything at all. Then I went to donate, but I was a little bit skeptical, seeing that if I'm hypotensive, would my blood count match? So my question is, is there a direct correlation between your hypo or hypertension and your blood count? No. Okay. But you, you can be excluded if you're hypotensive. Yeah, on, on the day, not if you're Generally high potential. Okay. You can be inferred on the face of your blood pressure on the day. The reason I asked you about the about the HB issue yeah. because I went to give blood yeah. uh, as a do as a volunteer yeah. uh, because our team was part of this thing, yeah. and then they said, "I'm so sorry, but um, but your whatever it is is low, so we can't you mm. can't do it." So I said, is, it, is this something that I'd exclude for an extended period of time? And then they suggested that I change my diet and do whatever and so forth. I'll come back. And I mean, I, I wasn't encouraged because I was like, well, what is the guarantee? And I always have in my mind, this is not something that I, I am eligible to because I have a I mean, and it's inherent and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I was saying to myself, that is, that is the level of education if you want to encourage women who may find themselves in that situation because of menstruation and so forth. So I think public education, if not advertising, is key, 
because we we might say, all right, fine, I'm not going to go down there because they're not going to take me anywhere. Which, you know, well, for Trinities, we do that. And they refuse me. No, the other thing, I'm going to mention that to get to have enough uh, blood to be the blood needs of the population requires 3% of the population donating once or twice per day. 3%. Small, small person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So really, all the uh, the other things in there are oh. really not good. They don't tap there. You just need to find the three percent. My question to you, yeah. since you're having a conversation with us and our yeah. colleagues, how do you see us coming together mm -hmm. to advocate? Mm -hmm. like what is in your mind in terms of building that advocacy and sustaining that? Advocacy? Well, very importantly, as, as our people of influence, um, can change the language. And our people understand that you don't need to force somebody. It's, it's a, a sacred act. Huh? And it's very, it's very noble, and uh, they don't get something in return or have oh, one inside. Expect the people that what, what is truly voluntary and advocated. And you don't have to ask people to see it happening. And it's happening and they'll just do it. Yes. So I'm huh? hearing from you that language changes in Yes, yes, because um, the Latin language has destroyed the, uh, the practice here. Right. Okay. Yes. Well, I have two things I really want to mention now. For the second, I don't know if I would like it. I'm not sure if I'm not going But first of all, you mentioned that only 6% of women in India um, donate blood. And what I was wondering is why is why is it so low in less developed countries? Why are uh, the percentage of women donating blood so low in developing countries as compared to the North Atlantic countries? Uh, good question. I think it's our uh, information. We got a lot of business. Yeah, I think maybe they may be a religious things as well. But I saw that in Saudi Arabia it's like 50 50. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe I'll um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, refer to the population and then the caring segment. So, so with the voluntary donation, because in the past you would have your pink card. That's, that you said is not voluntary because it acts as a credit, yeah. which I never really realized that. Mm -hmm. I always thought it was voluntary. Yeah. So, that with the UE thing, problem. is there some kind of record? or we is keep, a, we keep a record. You keep a record, yes. but the person doesn't get a no. card. Great. Okay, I see what okay. You have a blood donor card that I can show it to you. So, it just tells you. Uh, Sign whenever you donate. So I've donated all years of the blood drive so far. Yeah. And the ninth is on November 11th. Okay. And I'll be there as well. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, just one quick question. Cuba has um, a reputed way of applying healthcare your system. Yes. How do they manage blood donation? Well, they, are, they have 100% voluntary blood donation. I, I don't know what, what voluntary means uh, there, but they're listed as 100% voluntary contribution. You only be, be, at one point it was only the USA, Canada, and Cuba, in the region of the Americas, that was performing 100% voluntary, non remunerated contribution. Okay, we will take um, just, I know you had one, and that will be our last. Unless, okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, okay well, I know what Dr. Charles mentioned uh, that 50% of women, if that 50% of women were to donate blood, um, there would be a lot, right? So, and it may have came across what like, the onus is on the women. But I guess now the point you're trying to make is that if 50% um, of women could donate blood and get that land for them, imagine um, for the men as well, included. Mm -hmm. Or the the woman could basically be the what the I wouldn't say encouraging man, but the 
with the leading force yeah. at the time the leading demand. Lead the process. Yeah. They could be the leaders in the process. Lead the process. Yes. Yeah. Now, I just want to clarify again. So if I want to give blood voluntarily and I go to Charlotte Street, yes. can I say I don't want it on my car, I just want to give blood voluntarily? Or is this voluntary? You may, but I, I think it is uh, orchestrated so that uh, you know, probably not have a say in the matter. <laughs> so basically the only real voluntary right now is the UE. Investment. Yes, I don't know how many are going there and say I don't want any. I mean, I used to do it. I don't know how because it's, it's just given to you automatically. Correct. Right. Because, just, because yeah. you're not informed. We don't know. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah, yeah, you're not told. You're told this yeah. is voluntary. You yeah. volunteer. You give your blood yeah. and you walk away. Mm. But I suppose what you've been, what you've enlightened us, and, and we're just wrapping up. You've enlightened us that. We do have a challenge that is systemic, that is part of the healthcare system that needs to be re-evaluated. As well as we do have a challenge of language which affects people's attitudes, impressions, and approach to this life-saving process that we cannot live with me necessarily. And that we have a trend in terms of how women respond to 100% voluntary, non remunerated donations. And if we follow this trend, this, as this young man said, could be, could act as a catalyst to encourage more of the population. It's, it's, it's hopeful. It'll take well, some work. Well expressed. Yes. yes. <laughs> and I just want to thank everybody for coming. I suppose now, November 11th, if you have not already been giving your blood, then you would go give your blood and, um, and encourage others. I think it's very complicated how people respond. For example, the Gui population may, as you say, have more information, be more exposed to the information sources, education, and less perspectives that um, create, you know, yes, false beliefs around blood giving and blood donation. Now, before, you be, before you go on, before yes. this, mm -hmm. the lowest group of uh, blood donors is women and students. Well, look at that. Yeah, so we picked the two uh, of the weakest groups. Right, groups that were given. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'm sure um, you may ask more questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. And all the best. Thank you. Thank you.